The following program is a production of KSPS Public Television and is made possible by the Friends of Seven. I have so many great, wonderful memories of this city. In fact, uh, not too long ago, they voted on what was the best minor league team in the last 50 years, and the 1970 Spokane Indians finished first. It was a great team. They all went to the major leagues and had illustrious careers. Many spent 18, 19, 20. Charlie Huff is the last one of the bunch, and he is 46 years old. He played for me here at Spokane. We won the pennant by 26 games. It was a team that had courage, a team that had ability, that had unity, and uh, I was very, very proud of that ball club. To many of us, when you think about baseball in the Spokane area, you think about the PCL, the Pacific Coast League era. Well, there's a lot more history to baseball in Spokane, and we're going to look into that during this half hour. I'm Bill Stanley. Thank you for joining us. And joining me is Jim Price, local historian on baseball. Jim, thanks for joining us and being here. Oh, Bill, my pleasure. Hey, when did baseball really start in Spokane? Well, professional baseball came to Spokane and the rest of the Pacific Northwest back in 1890, 104 years ago largely because a man named John Barnes, who was an outstanding amateur athlete in a variety of sports, and also an outstanding sports promoter in his late 30s, was sent here from the Midwest by the Northern Pacific Railroad. And he had helped found the Minneapolis franchise and the original Northwestern League. He came out here and, and with the help of a couple other men, put together franchises in Spokane, Portland, Tacoma, and Seattle, and created the original Pacific Northwest League in 1890. Why? Why would you come to Spokane to start a league? Well, the railroads were still expanding at that time. In fact, the Great Northern hadn't even come to the Spokane area at that time. And so the railroads were looking for ways to generate traffic and baseball teams moving back and forth and the fans who might follow them, and that's alone the sports writers, uh, helped generate some of that and gave an excuse for people to travel between town to town. So in Spokane, we have uh, baseball players and they're playing where? Uh, they played at a ballpark that was located near the corner of Boone and A Streets. Uh, with the grandstand had been relocated from now the area that's uh, Spokane Falls Community College with a ramshackle wooden grandstand and a, and a little fence with a higher fence behind it in the outfield, a very short field. Uh, but Spokane's first team was an outstanding team that uh, with the help of some players that Barnes hired in the middle of the season after the Texas League folded, uh, gave Spokane a, a great second half team and they went on to win the pennant very easily. Now were these ball players professional ball players? Yes, minor league baseball as well as major league baseball had begun to expand pretty steadily by the early to mid 1880s. And so there was a pretty good established uh, company of professional ball players across the country, a largely Italian and German immigrants from the uh, Northeast. But uh, professional baseball was pretty well established then, and as a matter of fact, one of the players who helped Spokane win that first pennant in 1890 was a short, stocky infielder, the uh, Pete Rose of the 1880s and 90s, named Frank Piggy Ward. He was five foot nine, 199 pounds, and he whistled and yelled and dove head first into the bases and shouted and cursed the umpires, and a very colorful player and a great minor league hitter. What about the, the fans? I'm sure that this was probably a major social event that would go on during the course of the season, people going to a baseball game. It tended to be. As a matter of fact, early minor league parks in the 1880s and early 1900s usually had a section where ladies and gentlemen could sit, and then everyone else sat in the uh, bleachers, and bleachers are called bleachers because they were bare boards that sat out in the sun where the boards, if not the mm. customers, bleached. This could happen any time. It was a nice, wonderful day. The, uh, the fans, of course, uh, would follow their team locally. I'm sure that the teams, because they had to travel, and who was in the league at that time? Uh, Portland, Spokane, Tacoma, and Seattle. And this travel was all done by train? All done by train. And um, although later on, when Vancouver got into the league in Victoria in the 19 aughts, then there was some travel by boat from Seattle to Victoria or Seattle to Vancouver. There's a real social outing for yes. that. <laughs> did, you, did you find fans uh, leaving Spokane to follow the team at all back then like they may do they, now? They did some, but not as much as would be had in later years. But, but traveling was an adventure in those days, even by train. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, Northern Pacific uh, had gone through in the 1880s, and then the Great Northern came in the early 1890s, came through Spokane. And the Union Pacific went through from the east, Salt Lake City, and Umatilla, Oregon, to Portland. And so there were lots of train uh, trained companies, you know, developing their rail 
lines in that era. So 1890, the beginning, now up to World War I, we had baseball every year? Well, the, the early Pacific Northwest League only lasted two and a half years, uh, was done in by a variety of things, and then the panic of 19, 1893, a nationwide financial crisis, pretty well made it difficult for most minor leagues to survive that period, and the major leagues had some difficulties themselves. The league was revived in 1901, and ran continuously through 1917, when, with the help of World War I, it kind of ground to a halt, started up again right after World War I, and lasted three or four more years and then petered out. And then there was no more professional baseball except the Pacific Coast League in the Northwest until 1937. So after the, the war, uh, things got going for the, uh, the hometown how at that point in time. What was, what was the big thing about baseball? Semi-pro baseball was very big in the 1920s and 1930s, along with barnstorming teams like the House of David, which were the bearded guys from mm -hmm. Benton Harbor, Michigan. Uh, that traveled all the country and of course the uh, black players had their own professional leagues at that time but they also did a lot of barnstorming which was their opportunity to measure their skills both during the season and after the major league season against top professional white players and uh, Satchel Paige pitched in Spokane at least as early as 1932 and won by the way okay. and played here many years uh, through the 30s and 40s. Now with semi-pro you didn't have the uh, full-time ball player, you had people who were doing other things as well? These were part-time players who usually played anywhere from two to four games a week um, and had another job. On the other hand, particularly during the depression years, all through most of the 1930s, a player, particularly a pitcher, and pitchers were always, always paid more, a player who had a full-time job that maybe paid 15, 20, 25 dollars a week and could play two, three, four semi-professional games a week that paid him anywhere from oh five to fifteen or twenty dollars a piece could make a pretty good living during the three, four, five month baseball season and in this particular area the uh, Spokane City League which then evolved into the Idaho Washington League and took in teams from the Idaho mining areas like Wallace uh, was very fast level of ball and probably wasn't too different in its best years than the lower minor league teams that played here both before and after that. Now is this, uh, we're getting to the, the Idaho Washington League, is that uh, the time that this all comes into play? That would be from mostly from the late 20s until the uh, later 1930s. Although sometimes the Idaho teams would drop out and it would be the Spokane City League again for a year or two and then it would go right back again to the IWL because an Idaho team would come back in, mm -hmm. you know, Coeur d'Alene or there was a combine team for a while. But some outstanding players played in that league, uh, one of whom a Spokane native named Ed Brandt went on to pitch several years in the major leagues and was a very good major league pitcher. I w wanted to ask you about that, uh, ball players who were very good here, how would they get noticed by the majors to be picked up when they're playing semi-pro ball? Well during the 20s and much of the 1930s, nationally, particularly during the depression years, nationally there wasn't nearly as much minor league baseball. And so therefore, the scouts for the minor league teams didn't have as many minor leagues to travel through, so they would go to cities where the faster semi-pro leagues played, areas like Seattle and areas like Spokane and some of the Midwestern cities where there was very good semi-pro ball and winter leagues in places in like Southern California and scout the players there. Uh, Ray Flaherty, the great football coach and football pro football Hall of Famer who just died recently, uh, was an outstanding Idaho Washington League player, played a few years professionally as a baseball player, decided that his real future was in football, so he quit playing professional baseball, although he might have been a major leaguer, hmm. and then came back and played some more league years in the Idaho Washington League. Natatorium Park <coughs> always comes up when we talk about baseball and history of Spokane because there was a baseball field there and it was a great gathering place for people to come and watch games as well as be entertained with the other things at the park. Where did Natatorium Park come into the history of this? The, the area is a picnic ground dated back to the late 1880s and sort of expanded during the 1890s, including during the John Barnes era, who helped uh, manage one of the early facilities for entertainment, a restaurant and gambling hall during the early 1890s. And then the ballpark itself was constructed in uh, 1898, and professional play was held there starting in 1901 when the Pacific Northwest League was revived. And then they played there off and on either the uh, professional league, the Pacific Northwest League, or the Northwestern League, which it was later called. And then later on, the Idaho Washington League and Spokane City Leagues played there for up until 1940, 39, or 40, uh, to the World War II period. Mm -hmm. What happened during World War II? Was it things silenced more at that point in time? Well, yeah, generally speaking, because the shortage of manpower is both professional and semi-pro baseball contracted a great deal. Instead, the best leagues were either in the service or in the shipyards, like Seattle and mm -hmm. Portland both had outstanding shipyards leagues, where most of the players were outstanding professional players at the Class A and AA level, and a few major leaguers uh, concentrated in a couple of areas. But uh, and so the ballparks in some cases fell into disuse. That happened to Natatorium Park actually, uh, which had become pretty ramshackle by then, a 45-year-old wooden stadium, and it was used a little bit for uh, 
uh, midget auto racing and, and boxing and wrestling and things like that. And part of it burned down. And finally, the fire department, as a training exercise, burned down the remainder of it. And this is a true story. The firemen stood around afterwards and roasted marshmallows in the embers. <laughs> Natatorium Park, great history there. Where'd they go after Nat Park? In uh, the late Depression, George Ferris, who had come to Spokane as a professional baseball player right out of law school in 1903, uh, played here five years and, and then be moved into the law, later became the city corporation attorney, he had always been a big booster of, of baseball, amateur and professional. And at his instigation in the later years of the Depression, when it was clear that the future of baseball, if there was going to be one in Spokane, was not going to be at Natatorium Park, uh, pushed at the WPA, the Works Progress Administration, which across the country was building facilities of various kinds to put up some money to build Spokane a new baseball park. And in 1936, with his prodding, the local WPA administrator finally agreed and the government put up enough money to begin the construction of a field that ended up being named Ferris Field, named after George Ferris, that was located in the northwest quadrant of what was the old Spokane Interstate Fairgrounds, the property now occupied by Playfair Racecourse. Hmm. Back in that time, was baseball popular? Was it uh, something to do? Where did it rest upon the, uh, the individuals who came out to see although, it? Although it's easy to recollect for particularly most people under the age of 40 that the great attendance years in Spokane baseball were the early Dodgers years in the Pacific Coast League, and those were outstanding years. Spokane has really had several years of great baseball attendance. One of them was shortly after the construction of Recreation Park, which was located not too far from the old fairgrounds just off of Trent, uh, where the Northwestern League played from 1905 through 1915, that um, there was a big attendance boom nationwide in minor league baseball attendance, and it certainly affected Spokane as well, that during the 19678 period, every time the Spokane Indians went on the road, they built more ballpark. Mm -hmm. They'd add a section of bleachers, or they'd put a new roof part of the grandstand, and so the ballpark was built to seat, oh, about 2,500 people in 1905. By 1910, it would seat 8,000 and they just added 50, 60, 100, 500 seats at a time. Um, Ferris Field, when it opened and the Western Union National League was created in 1937, went through another great attendance boom. As a matter of fact, Spokane led the Western Union National League in attendance seven of the first nine seasons it operated. Most of those years, they not only led the league, they led all Class B cities in the country in attendance, mm -hmm. and in several of those years, they set national attendance records. Uh, 1937, 38, 39, just had tremendous crowds. Uh, for a relatively small ballpark that seated less than 5,000 people. And they would draw 230, 240,000 people for the season. And the 1947 team, an outstanding uh, team that, that nearly won the pennant uh, and had played a longer schedule, ended up drawing 287,000 people. That's uh, 47 years ago when the city was much smaller. Let's go back to the 1947 team. This was a team that was Dodger related, which a lot of people probably do not know. Uh, curiously enough, it was. After the terrible bus wreck in 1946, the new owner of the Indians at the time, a man named Sam Collins, had some ties to the Dodgers organization, and he got Branch Rickey to come out here, and they struck a tentative working agreement that helped them with a few players to replenish the roster at the end of the 46 season. And in 1947, Spokane had a full working agreement with the Dodgers, and the uh, Dodgers uh, sent several fine young players, uh, outfielder, first baseman by the name of Herb Gorman, an outfielder named George Schmees, a third baseman named Bobby Morgan, who played several years in the big leagues, a shortstop named Buddy Hicks. And Spokane had an outstanding team that won 100 games and still lost the pennant by .0009 because of a rainout on closing weekend. Oh, really? Was that the first time a Spokane team had been linked with a major league ball club? That was. And a few years later, uh, in the latter years of the Western Union National League, which then became the Northwest League again, uh, in the early 50s, Spokane had a working agreement for a couple of years with the Philadelphia Phillies. And Jack Spring, a local boy, and Ed Boucher, a Montana native, who played on the same Lewis and Clark High School team with Jack Spring, ended up they both played for that team and later played for the Phillies. So from, uh, we know a lot of those people right now. They're still around here, mm -hmm. of course, in the Spokane area. But uh, then from 1947, what was the next big step for Spokane teams? Well, uh, the 1948 team, with the working agreement ended, the team was sold. The 1948 team had almost entirely different personnel um, and was st struggling along at the middle of the season. The manager at that time had previously managed Wenatchee, a man named Buddy Ryan from Sacramento. A man in his 60s was not in good health that season. He caught pneumonia and and walking pneumonia anyway, and so he struggled physically all through the season. Finally gave up the team in the middle of the season because he didn't feel well and turned it over to one of his former prodigies, the great Major League First Baseman slugger Dolph Camilli, 
who uh, flew up from his ranch in California. He'd been retired and become a part-time baseball scout. And Camille flew up, took over the team with a record of 57 and 52, and they won, um, I think it was 48 out of their last 58 games and 28 out of the last 31 and won mm -hmm. the pennant with this incredible rally. A lot of no-name minor league players, although one great Northwest League minor league player, Ido Vanny, was on that team. Um, and then the uh, ownership changed again the following season. And, but after that season, there was a terrible fire that destroyed most of Ferris Field, and the ballpark was never the same. And after a couple of years, the attendance started going down sharply, and the finances of the ball club went down. Uh, the owner during most of that period was a man named Roy Hotchkiss. And finally, the last two years of Spokane's original membership of the Northwest League, 1955 and 56, it was a community-owned team. They sold stock around the community at, I believe it was $10 a share. A few of those stock certificates are still floating around, but I'm sorry to say they aren't worth anything. <laughs> they almost weren't worth anything then. And that gets us closer to the Pacific Coast League <clears throat> era, which started in 1958. Uh, what, was there any special momentum that brought it up to that, that point the, as far as people wanting to get the PCL into Spokane? Yeah, well, that was the period of major league, ex, major league movement. And the Dodgers and the Giants, rather abruptly, the Dodgers, Walter O'Malley decided the Dodgers were going to leave Brooklyn, which of course had a city-bound ballpark with no parking in the mis, you know, in a heavily populated area in Brooklyn, decided he was going to move in the polo grounds where the Giants played in New York was old, very old and ramshackle. And so O'Malley decided to move west and encourage the Giants to come with him. And so they moved west. And when they did, of course, they dislodged the minor league franchises, the Pacific Coast League teams that had played for years in Los Angeles and San Francisco. The Oakland and Hollywood franchises had moved during the previous year or two uh, to establish other uh, Coast League franchises at Salt Lake City and Vancouver. And so there were vacancies, and Spokane had this off and on reputation as being a great baseball town with great attendance uh, possibilities. Uh, and so at that time, the Dodgers came to Spokane, and they stayed for 14 seasons. Many uh, great ball players came through Spokane during that time of the PCL, and uh, uh, that just began things off. What do you, from your research, what you've gathered is probably the most uh, historical thing about the PCL era as far as uh, ball players. Well, certainly people remember the great crowds of the first three years, and indeed the first two Pacific Coast League teams, 1958 and 59, weren't very particularly very good teams. But Maury Wills played on those teams mm -hmm. and went straight from there, into, of course, to his long and uh, outstanding career, primarily as a base stealer, playing shortstop for the Dodgers and then later for Pittsburgh and Montreal. The 1959 team, which wasn't much better than the 58 team, particularly lacking a quantity of really outstanding major league prospects and not particularly good pitching, uh, had Tommy Davis on it. And Tommy Davis won a major league batting championship and was the original superstar designated hitter when designated hitters came in. The 1960 team did win the pennant and had Willie Davis, who became an outstanding outfielder for the Dodgers, and Ron Fairley, who, like Willie Davis, also ended up with more than 2,000 Major League hits, and that's a tough feat. Less than 200 players have still done that. And that was a very good hitting team. Uh, and then there were a lot of good players uh, over the decade in between there, particularly a lot of players who played a long time in the Coast League, Bart Shirley, uh, Nate Oliver, Tommy Hutton, players who played some in the Major Leagues but played a long time for Spokane. Shirley, as a matter of fact, played 900 96 games in the Spokane Indians uniform, uh -huh. all in the Coast League years. And then, of course, came the outstanding 1970 team, uh, which was judged in a poll by Baseball America last year to have been the best minor league team of the last 50 years. And that had uh, the MVP of that team was the great young shortstop, Bobby Valentine, who early in his major league career suffered a terrible leg injury and so didn't fulfill his promise. But Steve Garvey played part of the season on that team. Uh, Doyle Alexander, who just retired a little over a year ago with more than 200 pitching victories in the major leagues, was on that team. Bill Buckner was on that team for most of the season. Davey Lopes was on that team. Uh, Bill Russell was on that team, first as an outfielder and then moved to third base when R Garvey was called up to the big leagues. And of course, one of the pitchers on that team, a pretty good hitting, sometime relief pitcher, sometime starter that was trying to learn to throw the knuckleball, a guy named Charlie Huff yeah. was on that pitching staff. And of course, Charlie's Major League Baseball career just ended about two weeks ago. He's the longest a team, one that's been around. Yeah. A team that had extraordinary longevity. 13 players on that team, the 1970 Pacific Coast League Indians, 13 players on that team had Major League careers of 10 years or more. And of course, they had Tommy Lasorda too, which is an and Tommy Lasorda was a manager, and of course, he's shown pretty good longevity himself <laughs> as manager of the Dodgers. What about the uh, your story, the designated fishing person? Is that what comes mm -hmm. out of the Lasorda archives? Yeah, one of the stories of that period was the 1969 team, uh, which had some of those players that played on the 1970 team, including uh, Valentine, who was just being converted to shortstop, and and Buckner, and some of those. Uh, Eugene, Oregon, was in the Pacific Coast League at that time and was a Phillies farm club, I believe, then. 
was, uh, was not real far from the ocean, about an hour and a half or two hour drive. And uh, Lasorda got into the habit of when the team went to Eugene on a road trip, he would send catcher Steve Soggy, who was a former college football star, he would send catcher Steve Soggy, who was a very good fisherman, and the pitchers who weren't scheduled to work that night, he would send them over to the coast on a fishing trip. I believe they caught salmon. And they'd bring the fish all back to the hotel, and Lasorda cut a deal with the chef that the hotel could have half the fish if they'd cook the other fish for the baseball players. Oh, yeah. And they did that like, every road trip to Eugene, I think, for two or three years. <laughs> Very enterprising. <laughs> Tommy's when, always been enterprising. When you look back uh, into the PCL and the Dodger relationship, uh, and it always seems to me, I guess, that that was a love affair that Spokane had because they were a Dodger farm club. Uh, is that what you get to from your looking back in your research? Was that the popularity that really made Spokane what it was when it was back in the PCL? That certainly is the era that fans of a certain age are always going to remember. One, because some of the teams were very good. A great number of good future major league players played on those teams, maybe too, close to two dozen. Um, two or three may end up in the Hall of Fame. Maury Will still may end up in the Hall of Fame. Steve Garvey is likely to end up in the Hall of Fame. Some of the others are certainly going to get a lot of votes. And so, and of course, the attendance was great the first three years, and they had another pretty couple of pretty good years of attendance uh, in years when they had better, better spring weather that encouraged to have good attendance when you play a long schedule. Uh, and so certainly fans under 50 are going to remember that era. But as I mentioned a little bit ago, that's not the only era when Spokane had outstanding teams and drew great crowds. The early Western International League years in 1940 and 41, uh, Spokane won the Western International League pennants. Both years had outstanding records. The 41 team won the pennant by more than a dozen games. Mm -hmm. And the 1940 team, among some players who ended up living here locally, like a fine, fine center fielder named Dwight Aiden, had a minor league immortal who was now at the near the end of his career named Smeed Jolly on it, who was one of the greatest minor league players of all time. He would have been one of the greatest major league players, but he was awesomely slow and had a very strong but very inaccurate arm. And um, it was always said that he was always in danger of being hit in the head by fly balls. But he could really hit. And he played, uh, he won three Pacific Coast League batting championships. He played five years in the big leagues and hit 300. Well, he played for the 1940 Indians drove in 181 runs. His 100th RBI came on July the 1st. I think this guy could hit. He was 37 years old at wow. the time. And the 1940 team had Jolly's young successor, who was less expensive, but maybe almost as talented. And Jolly was sent on to Vancouver, where he won another batting championship, by the way. The 40 team had a young player on it by the name of Pete Hughes, who became one of the all-time great minor league players. Walked more than any man in the history of minor league baseball. Retired with a career batting average of about 345 but never got above the high minors because early in his career when he was a teammate from another guy who later settled in Spokane, a pitcher named Bob Costello who starred in Spokane's 47 team, when they were teammates in the early late 1930s in the Cincinnati Reds organization, Hughes in a sliding accident one year broke one of his ankles very badly and the next year he broke the other ankle very badly and so he walked or well, at least he attempted to run like a duck and so obviously compromised his career but a very talented player. Were games, uh, let's say back in the, the 20s or 30s, were they uh, well controlled? Were the fans well controlled? Uh, were they uh, the kind of games where sometimes you see the, the players obviously get into fights, the, the crowd, some things you go back and think about some of the times when you, you see the crowd coming out in the stands, that sort of thing. Was it a gentleman's game back then compared to some things that happened here in the later years? Periodically it was. In the early years, the players weren't gentlemen. They came from largely uneducated immigrant backgrounds and uh, were kind of rowdy, but they were colorful in the same way that in the 1940s, Edo Vanny was colorful. They did showmanship kinds of things and, uh, and had a good time, although they were sometimes bad tempered. As a matter of fact, in 1890, Spokane's uh, first season in the championship team, in the third game of that season, the man who was the captain who had been the on-field manager in those days was an outfielder from the Midwest named Fred Jevney, who in the third game of the season, upon having the first pitch to him, his first time up in the first inning, had a pitch that was clearly a ball, called a strike, turned around and cursed the umpire, who was a man named W.A. Cragen, who then stood there with Jevney standing with his back to the mound in the batter's box, ordered the pitcher to pitch. The next pitch was not near the strike zone. The umpire said, strike two. Ordered the pitcher to pitch again. Another pitch was not close to the strike zone. Jevney still nose to nose of the umpire, arguing. Pitches again. It's not near the strike zone. Strike three, he calls, whereupon Jevney punched him and knocked him out. So. But the players got a little calmer after that. But in the mid-19-aughts, when Spokane was in that period where they kept expanding the ballpark every time the team was on the road, 
Spokane's fans had a terrible reputation as being the worst in the league. Oh, really? These are in the recreation park days where there were a lot of stands that were close to the field. And uh, Spokane had a reputation for having a certain uh, segment of its male fan body that uh, spent a lot of time cursing and yelling at the players. But then for the Depression period came along, and of course people were having a hard time making a living, and so the players playing semi-pro ball were having a good time, and barnstorming, and it also improved their lives economically, of course, and the barnstorming teams coming to town were fun. Is then I think the players and the fans both tended to have a lot of fun through that period. And then sh and showmanship was big. You know, barnstorming teams would do all kinds of silly things. The House of David got famous for having a phantom infield, where they'd pretend to take infield practice with no ball. And that was a routine they did for 20, 25, 30 years, and they were famous for it, and people would come to the ballpark to see that. And, of course, a lot of the black traveling teams, uh, the Harlem Clowns, who had a basketball team, also had a baseball team, and the, and the thrown-together black traveling teams that Satchel Paige often played for. And showmanship was part of their game, and, uh, and that carried over to then when professional baseball got going again strongly, both at the end of the Depression and again after World War II, showmanship was very popular, and Edo Vanny was a great showman. Uh, and played on teams here with Eddie Murphy, who later settled in this area for a long time and ran a tavern in, in Hilliard. Hmm. As a matter of fact, they tell one terrific story. Murphy tells this story, and I think Vanny tells it too, is that when they were teammates, I think it was here in 1948, playing a game uh, in the Tri-Cities, which had a real high wall against the right field fence. As the batter hit a very high fly ball deep to right field. Vanny's playing right field, Murphy's playing center. The ball comes down with Vanny glued against the fence trying to make the catch. The ball skims off the fence, ricochets onto Vanny's head, knocks him cold and bounces over the head. Ground rule double. Although a lot of people remember the story of the home run. It was a ground rule double. Well, they have to carry Vanny off the field into the clubhouse. <laughs> Inning finally comes to an end. Murphy runs into the clubhouse because he and Vanny were very good friends. Runs into the clubhouse and says, How you doing? How you doing? Dago, way to use your head. He said, How are you? And Vanny opens his eyes groggily and said, well, I held him to a double. <laughs> <laughs> Jim, we'll, we'll stop it on that point. There's probably a million great stories within the history of baseball within Spokane, and I thank you for sharing a lot of those with us today. Well, it's been a long and fun uh, history of Spokane baseball, and it's been a pleasure being with you. Probably more to come. Thanks a lot, Jim. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for Baseball Spokane Memories. I'm Bill Stanley. Good night.